If you can only choose one, pick carefully. On Wednesday morning, the minivan is gone from the driveway next door, so I busy myself collecting words and phrases for Jason in the blank spaces of my sketchbook. Words from commercials, conversations, and books run between my doodles and across the backs of my drawings. The driveway remains empty until after dark. An hour before OT on Thursday, I lay my sketchbook open on my desk and flip through the pages, hunting for the right words and phrases to put on Jason's cards. Why not? He already has why, but why not is pushier, like why with a fist on its hip. Out my window, I see the minivan still parked next door. Why not? Because mom's calling clients and dad's at work, so David's my responsibility, that's why. Just for an hour, mom said, until we have to leave for OT. I've put on Thomas the Tank Engine video, so he shouldn't be any trouble. I pull forward two blank cards and scrawl, yeah, right, whatever. I know she needs me to babysit sometimes, but I hate when she tells me he shouldn't be any trouble. Trouble comes quick with David, and should doesn't have anything to do with it. He should remember to flush the toilet, too, but that doesn't mean it happens. When Mom had gone, I took my long mirror off my door and propped it at an angle against one corner of the living room so I could work at my desk and still see David reflected in the mirror. Every few words I make, I glance out of my bedroom doorway to the mirror. David stands at the TV, the remote in his hand. He loves rewinding the trains backward up the tracks and speeding them ahead, almost crashing over and over. I turn another sketchbook page and choose among the words written along the edge. Sure, you bet, excellent, perfect, frustrating, pretty, and dazzling. To jazz up the sketch and ske uh, stretch the words Jason has in bigger directions and joke so he can be sarcastic if he wants. I peek towards the mirror. The TV's train steams ahead, billowing smoke towards the shed. Watch out, David repeats, a perfect imitation of the narr narrator's voice. But at the last second possible for the smash, David hits pause. Jumping in front of the frozen TV picture, he waves the remote in circles like it's a magic wand. Watch out! On the next page is my half-finished portrait of Jason. I pick up a pencil and add the details I couldn't add in the waiting room. Eyelashes, thick eyebrows, and the outline of his thin lips. Part of me wishes I could tear this picture out of my sketchbook and crumple it into a tight ball so I don't hear his mother's scolding in my head when I see it, but the rest of me is bothered that it's incomplete, too much like a secret. Are you busy? A girl's voice asks. I drop my pencil and flash a look from my unmade bed to the folded clothes on the folded clothes piled on my threw. Cinnamon and nutmeg crane their necks to weak at mom and the girl from the next door standing in my doorway. I saw Chrissy coming up the walk, Mom says, smiling. Catherine, I have one more call to make. Could you keep an eye on David for a few more minutes? Then I'll be I'll take over, I promise. Before I can get out, no, I see Mom's legs in the mirror, hurrying back towards her office. David pushes rewind, and Thomas speeds backwards again. Come in. I offer my chair, but Chrissy sits on the edge of my desk, crossing her feet at the ankles. Are you busy, she asks? No. Seeing her up close, I know Chrissy will be popular. Not only for her straight brown hair parted off center, shining down to her elbows, or because she looks just right even wearing frayed jean shorts and a t-shirt, Chrissy radiates cool, and I know it is as sure as I know David will stop that speeding train at the last second. Part of me feels sorry because she doesn't look like a flashlights and Morse code kid, but the other part of me is excited. I'm glad Mrs. Bowman sold your so sold you her house, I say. Well, I guess technically the realtor sold it, but I'm glad your family bought it because I've always thought it would be great if a kid lived next door. Mrs. Bowman was nice, but she was really, really old. I clamp my teeth together to keep anything else dumb from escaping my mouth. Chrissy drags a strand of her hair between her fingers. I'm glad, too. I was scared I'd have to start school next year without knowing anyone. My lips spread into a smile, imagining Melissa's surprise as I introduce Christy into our group. This is my friend Christy, I'll say. We hung out together all summer. I glance out the doorway to the living room. Where's David? Ryan said there's a bus stop at the end of our street. I lick my bottom lip to keep from grimacing. At the corner. That's great, Christy continues to twist her strand of hair. I used to walk three blocks to catch the bus, even when it was freezing or raining. Mom say, take the umbrella, as though anyone carries an umbrella. David insists on bringing his re bright red umbrella to school, even when it's only cloudy. My mom's like that, too. Leaving out, 
isn't the same as lying. She always says, well, at least you wear your hood, I continue, like I'd want hood hair. Chrissy smiles, letting that twisted strand fall back to her arm. Ryan said he lets kids wait in his house when it's raining, since he can see the bus from there. But only if you're invited, I peek in the doorway, into the empty le living room. Part of me would like to tell Christy the truth, but I don't want our con conversation to become about David. At the bus stop, I always tell him, you have, you have your umbrella, grabbing the back of his jacket to keep him from following Ryan's friends up the steps. Going inside is for kids without umbrellas. I would be honest, but David's, David doesn't understand invited and not invited. He thinks everything is for everyone. Ryan's nice, Christy said. Don't you think so? Nice as a cockroach. Want some sherbet, I ask? When you want to get out of answering something, distract the questioner with another question. What kind, Christy asked. Raspberry. David rushes through my doorway, his eyes wide with panic, an audio cassette in his hand. Fix it? The tape has pulled out of the ca cassette, hanging in a long, delicate loop. At first, I'm relieved. That's all that's wrong with the... Uh, all that's wrong until my guinea pigs start to squeal. With the cassette over one ear and his hand shielding the other, David yells, Quiet, pigs! Chrissy shoots a worried glance from David to the guinea pigs to me. I pry the cassette from David's fingers, knowing it'll be faster to deal with the tape than the tears filling his eyes. Don't worry, this'll only take a minute. I spin the cassette around and around my finger, wishing I had two more hands, one to give the guinea pigs hay to quiet them, another to cover David's mouth as he shrieks. I spin the cassette so fast my fingers keep slipping out of, my t out of the tiny hole. When the tape lies flat and tight, I slide frog and toe together into my cassette player and push play. Arna LaBelle's deep voice joins the guinea pig squeals, and David's face lights up like Christmas morning. Halloween night and his birthday all rolled into one big grin. You fixed it. Go find Mom, I say, pressing the cassette into his hand, and tell her I am done babysitting. Before I close the door, I peek into the living room to be sure David's heading towards Mom's office. He disappears down the hallway, swinging his arms. That must be hard, Chrissy says. Even regular little brothers are a pain. Regular snarls in my stomach. I grab my sticky notes and write, Dad, buy a new tape player, and stick it to the back of my door to remember to tell him again. To quiet the guinea pigs, I pull strings of Timothy hay from the little bale and I keep under the cage. Not Maggot yips as Cinnamon steals her hay. They're so cute, Christy says. Can I hold them? Sure. I toss her a towel. Better put that on your lap in case they pee. I slide one hand under Net Meg's chest and cup her back legs with my other. Cinnamon weeks until I set her next to Nutmeg on Christy's lap, and the squealing turns to happy pig cooing. Nutmeg, I thought, I'd never see you again. Say, what are you eating? Towel, medium rare, with a hint of fabric softener. Care for a bite? Don't mind if I do. My door bursts open. No toys in the fish tank, David announces. I'll be right back, I say to Chrissy, between my clenched teeth. No problem, she says, stroking up Meg's neck. I close my door behind so Chrissy won't see me run. Why? I sprint ahead of David. Why today? Because a tiny cowboy stands bow-legged on the gravel at the bottom of the fish tank, one hand poised to grab his pistol and the other holding at the end of a lasso, hovering in a loop above his head. A goldfish swims right through the hole. Get back here, you pesky varmint. Plunging my hand into the water, fish swoosh past my fingers. I rescue the cowboy and throw him into the toy box. Grabbing David's wrist, I don't even wipe my hand first. Wet, David twists it to get away from me. You're not going to ruin this for me. I yank him alongside, or along behind me down the hallway to Mom's office. She's on the phone. All right then, Mom says into the receiver. I'll look forward to hearing from you next week. I have company, I say, not caring about interrupting her, and you need to watch David. Mom holds up the one finger for me to wait, and I, but I push David ahead of me into the room. Her eyebrows come down. She grabs a puzzle off the bookshelf and dumps the pieces on the floor. Yes, that'll be fine, she says into the phone. David sits behind, beside the pile of pieces. He can't stand to see puzzles undone, but he insists on doing the pieces in lines, like he's reading the puzzle. He doesn't look for all the red barn pieces or the daisies or in the field or the glimmers of sunlight in the water. Left to right, top to bottom, that's his puzzle rule. And if you add a piece out of David's order, he'll take it back out, even if it fits. I slam Mom's office door on my way out. When I come back to my room, breathless from running down the hallway, I notice Nutmeg and Cinnamon are in their cage again. Everything okay, Chrissy asks? I hope you don't mind that I looked at this. She's holding my sketchbook. 
open half to the half-finished portrait of Jason. Is he your boyfriend? No, just a boy I started drawing. Chrissy tilts her head in a, oh, really, look? If you want someone to think something's not important, use just a lot. He's just a boy I know from, well, I don't really know him. Not very well. I just see him at, I check my watch. It's almost time to leave for OT. I can't tell Chrissy I have to go. Not the first time we've met, but I told Jason I'd see him today. Chrissy toss, tosses my sketchbook onto my desk. My hands itch to flip the page, but that'll bring attention to it. Want to watch TV? Chrissy asks. If I say no, maybe I won't get another chance to hang out with her. I glanced at Thomas the Tank Engine reflected in my mirror. His eyes closed, braced for a crash that'll never happen. From somewhere, David shrieks. We could watch at my house, Chrissy says. That stings, even if I agree. Sure, I say. I'll tell my mom. All the way up Chrissy's walkway, I want to skip or run or twirl him with my arms out like a six-year-old. It feels deliciously easy to be visiting a friend's house without having to say first, Sorry, David. This is for me. You can't come. Hearing Mom's car back out of the driveway, I turn to wave. She waves, but David sits alone in the back seat, hunched down, his hands over his ears. I follow Chrissy up the steps and through her front door.